scripture tells us that there is only one God. This has prompted some to proclaim that Yeshua does not exist or that he was a prophet, while others say he is Michael the archangel. Yet, we have verses of scripture calling the Father and Yeshua God. Also, Peter made reference to the Holy Spirit as God in Acts 5 verse 4. So how can all three be God if the God of Israel says, besides him there is no other? Family, I believe this message is of great importance. We're going to be talking about the flesh, the will, and the emotions. I want to connect it to what we know and understand about who Yahshua is. I'm so thankful for our brothers and sisters working hard to share this truth about the divinity of Messiah. And obviously, it's a message that the Father wants us to focus on, to bring us all into the truth of who he is. It's a deep concept to understand. I believe there's a genuine effort to get our people to see these truths, we need to understand that Yeshua and the Father are one. The beautiful thing about all of this is that we've been given various gifts. They should work together in tandem for the edifying of the body. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. So sometimes we need to hear it multiple times and have it presented in many ways before we get it. But we should all come to the same truth of who he is. I was actually working on part three of the series, America's at the Point of No Return, and I was redirected to cover this topic. So this is a revelation of truth that's vitally important for us, particularly now, Israel. Scripture says that we know in part I believe that when we come together with a sincere heart to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, it allows the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts to help us understand and receive truth. These various gifts that we have allow us to function in our roles for the edifying of the body and the kingdom of the Most High. Praises to Yah for this. I see this as something very beautiful. So the truth about who Yahshua is, it's a deep revelation I believe those who have ears to hear will hear. So I encourage you to take notes. Go back and read these scriptures. Meditate on them. But don't just hear the words. Study them out because this is foundational truth. Take a look at this scripture. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, or Yeshua, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. But I also want to caution those who say that Messiah has not come. You are really in agreement with those who say they are us. They don't believe it either. So for those still in doubt, about whether or not Messiah came and you're saying no one came to die for us, I'm begging you to turn this off now and go and reconcile Zechariah 12:10 within your own self first because the enemy will not allow you to receive what I'm going to share today. Hebrews 3:15 says, If you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. Matthew 13, 23 says, the seed sown on good soil is the one who hears the word and understands it. So if it's not sown on good soil, the enemy will snatch it away. So take a look at this next scripture. 
Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Who's speaking here? Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Who is this referencing? You need to go and pray and seek the Most High for revelation concerning this scripture right here. You need to understand who is the one that's supposed to be pierced. If the one who was to be pierced has not come yet, then this scripture is yet to be fulfilled. So then that means there is a point in Israel's future when Zechariah 12 will have to be fulfilled. And if that's the case, you have to know that there is much more pain and suffering ahead for us as a people. So don't go beyond this point. Go back and you pray about this scripture right here first. So let's get started on this. I want to begin at the beginning uh, with Adam. When Adam was created, we were in him. We were in his loins. So Abba, our father, the creator, sent us here in Adam or placed us in him when he created him. When Adam sinned, we all sinned because we were in him. This is why it says we were born in sin. Take a look at this from Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Colossians 1.12-15 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So after Adam sinned, he lost dominion. Those who were in his loins became subject of another kingdom. It was the kingdom of darkness. The fathers had to send Yahshua into the world to destroy the works of darkness and to redeem us. This tells us, though, that he is the image of the invisible God. When we see him, we see the Father. If he did not come, then how are we delivered from the power of darkness? Let's look at this from John 14, 8 through 10. Philip is speaking to Yeshua and he says to him, show us the Father and it'll be sufficient for us. So he's responding to Philip and he says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work. So Yeshua is making a pretty bold claim right here. He's saying that when you see me, you see the Father. Is he saying they are one in the same or are we missing something? But do you see how deep of a mystery this is? Philip walked with him, yet he didn't understand the, the mystery. But let's look at what he says, what he said to Philip. I am in the Father, in him. He lived in him because he is the word that came out out of him. The Father's word is God. I'm going to take you back to Genesis 1 so that you can see this. Genesis 1, 24 through 28. 
Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness who is the us being referenced here when you're saying us in our you're not talking about a singular being let's go on he says let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created in his own image. Now we're talking about a singular being. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now let's stop. What's being referenced here are those who are involved in the creative process. The Father, His Word, and His Spirit. And I'm going to show that to you in a few minutes. But I want to pay attention to verse 27. He made man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. Well, Eve hadn't been created yet. He's saying male and female, he created them. Adam came on the scene first. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now let's identify the us referenced in the previous passage. We're starting with Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, this is the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So we have the creator God creating the heavens and the earth, but there's another entity it says the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. It says his spirit hovered. It didn't say God hovered. His spirit hovered. Let's keep reading. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, this is where you have to pay close attention. When he wants to create something, he says something. The words coming out of his mouth is a creative force. His words are a creative force. Then God said, this entity cannot be seen like his spirit cannot be seen both though come out of him his word and his spirit work in tandem the one deity known as god the father calls his spirit and the word coming out of his mouth god they are not three gods his spirit and his word are a part of him they are him they are expressions of himself he continues throughout uh, verses uh, 13 with this creation or his creation and he expresses his thought and will through words i hope that makes sense let's keep going 
All right, now we're at the part where he has created Adam. He puts him in the garden. And stay with me through this part because it will come together when we talk about the part that Mary had to play. So I'll pick up here with Genesis 2, 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the, gr the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Where is Eve? She's already in him. But the time has not come for her to be manifested yet. So now let's drop down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. He gave him a job before he gave him a wife. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, so after he created the man, he gave him Torah. He gave him commands, the laws that he has to keep. Let's take a look at that. What is Torah? This is from Strong's 8451, Direction instruction law let's drop down to see how it's used custom instruction instructions law laws ruling teaching or teachings adam was given torah let's go back all right let's go back to genesis 2 in verse 18 now the creator is saying it's not good that this man that he has formed to be alone so he's going to make a helper that's comparable to him so then he in verse 21 he causes a deep sleep to fall on adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place then the rib which the lord god had taken from man he made into a woman and he brought her to the man notice that she was already in him but the time has come for her to be manifested but there is something about her form that is to be different from adam's because of her function she's the vessel through whom all of the other seeds that are already in adam will come through so the Most High has to fashion her specific to this purpose. She's made with a womb and the parts that will be needed to receive and nourish seed so that they can reproduce. Notice that it says she's comparable to him. She's his helper. She's manifested to help him be a producer. And just a note, bearing children is not the only function of the woman. She has various functions, just like Adam. Abba, who placed gifts and talents in her, created her to help her husband. That's why it says when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. He obtains favor from the Lord. Men, if you get a revelation of that, you will see that things are stored inside of your wife that attribute to your success. You have to learn how to draw it out. Let's go on. So to fulfill Genesis 3.15, where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, he's speaking to Satan or the serpent, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In order to accomplish this, Yah would use the reproductive system he has just set in place to bring forth Messiah. So Hebrews 2, 14 tells us then that for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, meaning Messiah or Yeshua, also himself likewise took part of the same, which means he had to be flesh and blood, that through death 
he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So then the word had to be born into the world into the world in the same way that men are born after the fall of Adam. They need a fleshly body and they need blood to live as man in the earth. What came from above was his divine nature, his spirit. So when Adam fell, his nature changed. Adam's flesh or his body that was created from earth didn't die immediately. But if you remember when the father created him, he made him from the dust of the earth and then breathed life into him and he became a living soul. So when he sinned, that which came from the earth didn't die immediately, it died later, but he died spiritually, meaning connections were lost. He was, he was now disobedient to Torah or the command of the sovereign and something had to die, which is why coverings were made for them. And he lost his mantle or his covering. So let's keep going. So now when you read Isaiah 9 and 6, it is clear that we see this duality here of a natural man and a spiritual man. For unto us a child is born, the son of man that has the fleshly body. Everything that we have to deal with in our fleshly body, he had to deal with. Unto us a son is given, the son of Yah. This was the spirit now that's in this son to do the will of the father. His job was to overcome the sins of the flesh. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And this, this part tells us who he is. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. We know that the Holy Spirit in John is called the Counselor, Mighty God. So how can we say he's not God when this is telling us this is what his name is going to be called? Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is telling you they are one in the same. The Father is the Son. The Son is the Father. The Spirit and the Word came out of the Father. Now we have this prophecy from Isaiah confirming Genesis 3.15 that the Son of the Highest is going to be born in the earth. Now we'll see how the body that the Father creates for him would be manifested in the earthly realm. Here in Luke 1, 26 through 35, we'll see an interaction between the angel Gabriel and Mary. Gabriel was sent to her to bring a word from the Father. He sent his word to heal them and deliver them from destruction. Psalm 107, 20. So Gabriel brings the seed. And remember, seeds are given to reproduce, but it has to be placed in something that will allow it to do so. So he speaks words to Mary. Let's look at this and see what happens. Verse 26 tells us that he was sent to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. 27 tells us, He's sent to a virgin who's a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph and the virgin's name was Mary. Twice now we see she's a virgin. 28 tells us when he came into her, he greets her and tells her she's highly favored, that the Lord is with her, that she's blessed among women. 29 tells us when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and wonders what this salutation or this greeting should mean. Verse 30, the angel says to her, don't fear, you have found favor 
with God. Now let's read 31 to see the words that were sent from on high to Mary. It says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name. Here you see Jesus. His Hebrew name was not Jesus. So his name shall be called Yeshua. Verse 32 tells us he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. 33. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom and of his kingdom there shall be no end. 34. Now Mary has a question. How can this be seeing I know not a man? Once again, she is confirming she has not been with a man. She says, I know not a man. Verse 35, he tells her what's going to happen. He says, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. So now we seeing the Spirit being transferred and the power of the highest will overshadow thee. What is the power of the highest? Well, Hebrews tell us his word is his power. It goes on to say, therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Remember, the Son is given, the child is born. The child would be born in the fleshly body which contains all of the things that we inherited after the fall of Adam. So Mary comes into agreement with the Most High. If you remember when Abraham believed the word that was given to him, it was accounted as righteousness. So now with her faith, she's activating this word that's given to her. She believes. So now her body would be used to carry the seed. There is a duality represented here. He is both God and man. He comes as the last Adam. So created in that same form, same likeness. In the child that is born, the sin nature is contained in his flesh. In the son that is given, he's carrying what man needs to live, Torah. He is Torah, living inside of man, which is where the father wanted it to be in the first place. But the duality of who he is, is the revelation. All of us are this way. We are tripartite beings. We have a mind, body, and soul. Let's read this from 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus or at the coming of Messiah. He who calls you is faith, faithful who also will do it. So this indicates that the spirit, the soul, and the body are different and distinct. We're spirit beings, but we live in a body. Your body's not you. As a result of the fall, we all came into this world with a sin nature. It wants to do its own thing. It dwells in your flesh. Romans 6, 6 through 7 says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. What exactly is the old nature or the old man then that was crucified with Messiah? The old man is your human or sin nature. 
the Most High provided a way for us to be free from the power of sin, to have it not functioning in our lives where it has control as in our master. So when we come to understand that the power source for sin has been cut off, then we can know now that we're under a new source. We've been connected to the power source from on high. This is what Adam lost in the beginning. So Yeshua came to show us how to do that. He was tempted in every point, just like we are, but he did not sin, according to Hebrews 4.15. So when Adam sinned, he disobeyed Torah, the commandments, the law that was given to him. To get everything back that Adam lost, the father sent Torah or the word wrapped in flesh. He came under the same conditions that we were born into. It was in his flesh. The son was given, but remember the child is born. That child was born with that flesh that we have. So that means he came with the same ability to sin as those he came to save. But look at the connections. Adam was created by Abba himself. So was Messiah. He gave Adam free will. Yeshua had to have the same free will. But here's the mystery. The son was given the word made flesh. He was the father's will. He was the father's will. I think this part right here is what's throwing some people off because we have scripture where Messiah says, I do what my father says, or we see him praying to the father. Let's read this from Hebrews 2, 5 through 9. It says, for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, or Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might might taste death for everyone so when the father speaks his word does what he sends it to do it is the expression of who he is but now he has created a body and he anointed his word and sent it to do a specific thing. The same way we have to do life, he has to do life. He's been made a little lower than the angels to experience life in a body. His body can't go back into the, the bosom of the father in his current form. He's living as the son of man. So he prays. And he's led by the spirit. We connect to the kingdom through the spirit. It's the same thing. So the scripture says the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. He's listening. And he says, I do what I see my father do. Again, he's there's the duality here of him living life as a man, but his spirit is of the father. Remember, he came out of the father. The father's word is his will. So when he says in John 6, 38, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, 
but the will of him that sent me. Who sent him? He's the word that came out of the Father. He was anointed and sent to do a specific thing, undo the works of darkness. So he buffeted his body for 40 days. He brought it under subjection. And when Satan came, how did he defeat him? He used words. He said what the Father said. What all of this means is that we were trapped in a body of sin, the sin nature, because of Adam's fall. We were born into a fleshly, carnal body with a mind of its own. It has its own will, own emotions. It's like being trapped in a body with another person who's waging war against you. It wants to commit fornication. It wants to commit adultery. It wants to steal. You know, it gravitates towards evil. <laughs> so you may be doing the best you can to live holy, but you're fighting against a body that wants to do the things that you don't want to do. Paul sums it up perfectly when he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So the law had to be given to serve as signposts to let us know, hey, fornication is wrong, stealing is wrong. It served as a placeholder to restrain the evil tendencies of this flesh until the deliverer could come. When he came, he defeated it and gave us the power to do the same. But we all know this is a day by day thing. The beauty of it is his sacrifice served as the penalty for sin once and for all. So if you don't accept the free gift, that he brought, how do you pay for your sin? Because something has to die. The wages of sin is death. He died so that you would not have to. Look at this from Romans 7, 1 through 4. Paul is speaking. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. You cannot do enough good works in your own strength to live this thing out apart from the free gift that Messiah gave to us. It says, for the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. Now think of that in terms of Israel. Israel is described as a woman. That woman, Israel, committed adultery against her husband. Look at the verse. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. To win us back, the Most High sent Yahshua to die so that he could now restore us back unto himself. He died. Verse 3, So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. The Father transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness, and he transferred us into the kingdom of his Son. You all, this is the mystery. It's the revelation so that he could win his people back, get his people back, the kingdom back. <laughs> wow. So we covered quite a bit today. I'll pick up where we left off in the next session. And we'll also talk about worshiping the father and his son. These are also key points that tie into what was covered in this session. And I want to be able to devote 
enough time to that. So be sure to like and share and join me next time. Shalom, everyone.